Okay, we gotta talk about the villains in Agents of Mayhem. I guess most people didn't notice. These villains are built on an astonishingly good foundation. The villain soil they're growing from is really rich. Richer than almost any I've ever seen. But nobody noticed because the game is essentially unfinished. These are early versions of these villains telling fragments of early versions of their stories. We don't get to see the fruits of the trees growing out of this villainous soil. Now somebody came by and weed whacked them, and uh, they never got to grow up. That's why you never noticed that the foundation is extremely good, but I would hate for this technique to get lost to time. This is one of the few villain building techniques that's really, really good. It's so easy to use and powerful, and I don't even know if they did it on purpose. Maybe this is just happenstance, a random event that came out of the strange maelstrom of their development cycle. Maybe it was an accident, but we can do it on purpose, and maybe they did it on purpose too. Let's talk about it. You're making a superhero game. You need six villains. Go! What's your instinct? Well, most people have the instinct of uh, just buying some. This is a Batman game. Let's buy Batman. Let's buy his super villains. That doesn't really work great. Um, I've never been happy with it. The problem is that those supervillains are comic book supervillains. They're invented year by year by year by year by year to oppose Batman solo. For the most part. They shine best when they're allowed to challenge Batman on one particular facet of Batman's personality. That's the whole point. That's the reason they exist. Joker is codified as someone that is basically nihilist Batman. So his whole shtick is that he tries to pull Batman down into nihilism and try and shake Batman's goody-two-shoe foundations, and that's when he shines the most. And we can say that for all of, most of the various Batman villains. Uh, Catwoman, a basically amoral Batman. Poison Ivy. Poison Ivy is basically moral Batman. I'm joking for fun there, but the point is that these villains are all intended to oppose Batman on some facet of Batman's personality in a one-on-one -on -one conflict. Now, you can make these people team up. It's possible. That happens a lot in Batman specifically. But to me, it always feels very forced. There's always some stupid shtick that I have to turn my brain off to allow and one villain is usually allowed to shine, and the rest are just there to make up numbers. The more villains that are combined into one operation, the less each villain shines. And if your villain isn't shining like a supernova, they're not a supervillain, are they? So, this is not a very good setup, and people have gotten so used to how comic book villain works, you know, the comic book approach to supervillains, that they just sort of assume that that's how it always is. Yeah, when you got more supervillains, they don't shine as brightly. But that's just because they're in the wrong genre. That's because they're comic book villains that were invented to do something else entirely. In a video game, the villains are the tapestry. We're going to be passing the hero off from villain to villain to villain to villain to villain, and we want every single one of those exchanges to feel natural and empowering. We want every single exchange to make the next villain feel like a supernova. We want every single villain to always feel big and cool and have something meaty to talk about, something that really drives them. We want their pathos to take front and center and really overwhelm the player. That should be what we're aiming for with a supervillain. We fundamentally can't get that if we build our supervillains like comic book supervillains are built, one by one, to oppose a hero. It's not a very good approach. And the problem is, even if we invent our own supervillains, we often try and inherit the philosophy behind building comic book supervillains, which is each one needs to be distinct, have their own shtick, uh, each one needs to oppose the hero in their own way, and none of that really works for a video game, especially if the player is allowed to choose between several different heroes. Now, if the villains in your video game have to work together, then it would make sense, I think to build villains specifically to work together. Which doesn't exactly sound like a galaxy brain moment, 
But when's the last time you did that? When's the last time you built supervillains specifically to support each other? Let's talk about how they do it in this game specifically. All of these villains are techno-villains. They're all mad scientists. They all have the same theme. And that should feel kind of anathema. That should feel very strange if you've ever tried to design a pack of supervillains. Supervillains that have the same theme? Doesn't that feel small? Doesn't that feel constrained? Nope. Not at all. Because they all have different lenses on that theme. They all have different obsessions and takes. And instead of pulling out some facet of Batman's personality, they pull out some facet of the theme. The most important feature of this is that they can work together. And that's true on both a shallow level and a very deep level. Let's talk about the shallow level. They can work together in a literal sense. So let's say that currently we're fighting Mr. Gaunt down here. Well, he is a mediocre singer that's obsessed with becoming a pop star. So he uses his technologies. He's very good at creating technology. He uses his technologies to make better performances. He's got a, a necklace that does all of his auto-tuning for him. He's got like light shows and smoke, and he's got a floating barge that flies over his various uh, you know, performances, and he flies around. and He just puts on great performances, and that's the idea. He uses his technology to get lots and lots of people to follow him, and he turns into a supervillain because he decides that if his performances aren't good enough, he'll just flat out hypnotize people. And so that's what he's in the middle of doing during this game. And I mean, it's um, his story is not terribly well told, but you know, that's fine at this point. We're not talking about that. We're talking about how it fits together with the other villains. He uses some VR tech to try and charm people, but let's pretend that we want to hook him up with another villain in the game. How do we set up another villain to be backing him so that when we defeat him we can move on to the next villain in a way that makes the next villain seem stronger? Well, let's just go through them. Here's Hammersmith. Hammersmith loves guns, so we can set this up as the hypnotic sonic beam that he's sending out to overwhelm people's senses is actually a sonic cannon that this guy invented as a weapon. And you know, if the players piss Gaunt off, it can still be used as a weapon. Hmm. Or this lady. She's the brain lady, so she is ideal for helping Gaunt with his uh, idea to take over all of these people's brains and make them love him. What he doesn't know is that she's also going to suck the brains out of all of his groupies and use them for her own nefarious deeds, which is actually what happens in the game, although it's unrelated to Gaunt. How about this guy? He's a cybernetics guy, so he can build Gaunt some cybernetic vocal cords that can actually sing, because Gaunt certainly can't. And then when Gaunt is defeated, he can turn those vocal cords into dog mode to prevent Gaunt from being able to tell you any of his secrets. And from then on, Gaunt can only communicate by barking. And ironically, he puts out a very successful Christmas album. <laughs> What they do in the game is this lady. She is an AI, and she's the one that actually does all of Gaunt's performing. Gaunt is a terrible performer. She is a great performer. She's specifically created to perform, and that's how Gaunt can maintain his, his incredible performances with an AI assistant. We can just mix and match these villains all day, and it just feels natural and easy because they all have the same theme. They all have different lenses on it. They're like a Venn diagram of that theme, right? But they can all support each other. Whatever one of them is doing, it's almost certain that any of the other ones could have some kind of valuable input into it because they're at least vaguely related. And it's related in a way that makes logical sense. It's not like you have to invent a reason for them to be related. When you figure out why they're related, suddenly you realize that the plot can go in some really fun directions because of that relationship. That's so much fun, and it's so powerful, and it's something that comes naturally out of these villains when you set them up correctly. Which they've done here by simply making them all have the same theme. With different lenses. Which I'll keep saying until it's really hammered home. 
In the game, what actually happens is when you defeat Gaunt, you realize that this lady has been doing all the work, but before you can really challenge her, she actually hooks up with this guy over here because he is obsessed with becoming more than human. He wants to become an AI. He wants to become a robot. Guess what? She already is one, so they fall in love. And it's very sweet. But it leads us into our next part of this discussion. These villains can support each other on a deeper level. We want every villain to be a supernova. We want every villain to shine with a brightness that is blinding. And that means that their pathos, their personal obsessions, their story really needs to hammer home. And I mean, every villain can do that. Every villain is built around some kind of event like that, some kind of story system like that. But these villains can do it together. They can support each other because they're all pointed the same direction. Their lenses on the same topic, and those lenses overlap. For example, this guy wants to become more than human. He wants to become an AI and leave his humanity behind, but he can't get rid of all of his emotions. In the video game, he falls in love. He falls in love with an AI, which makes sense because that's who he's trying to be. And so you get this really poignant moment where he's trying to be more than human. He's trying to leave his humanity behind, but he's fallen in love and he wants to start a family. Now in the video game, it goes by in like 20 seconds because it's incredibly rushed, but it's a very poignant setup, right? His whole shtick, his lens is that he wants to become more than human, but he can't. He can't leave his humanity behind. He's shackled by it in a way that he's happy to be shackled by in some cases. Here's the trick. Her lens is also shining at this same moment. She wants to be more than just a performing cyber monkey. She wants to be able to become more and feel more and explore the world and know what it's like to live in this vast, vast world. And so she falls in love with this guy. And uh, then he dies, sort of. He dies. And uh, yeah, she suddenly becomes a lot more human than she ever wanted to be when she is racked by grief. These are incredibly good story beats. These are the pathos, the power behind these villains. Taking front stage, the lenses are shining. We are seeing exactly what these villains are about. That's exactly what we want. And they're doing it together. They support each other. And you might be thinking, yeah, but that's like the specific thing that they set up to do that in the video game. Oh, sure. But I mean, we could replace her. There, this lady is dead. Let's come up with an alternate story. This guy, he wants to become more than human. He wants to leave his humanity behind and become a robot, but he's scared to get rid of his brain. I mean, his brain is him, right? Can he really replace his brain with cyberware? What a terrifying idea that is. This lady is fully human, except some asshole gave her a chip in her brain that is totally screwing it up. You can really clearly see how those two lenses would really show really well supporting each other. They, that doesn't even have to be like a romantic relationship. Just the fact that one of these people is striving to become more than human and leave their humanity behind, and the other person was forced to get to that same place without, you know, permission. It's two lenses on the same subject, and it was super easy to figure out and to come up with. We can see both of these characters shining, and we can see how they might come in conflict or they might work together and it can evolve over time and the conclusions they come, co come to can change and pressure the whole situation. Oh, meaty, meaty stuff. And it's really easy to come up with. You can throw these villains up in the air in any combination and they just snap together and sparkle because they all have the same theme. They're all focused in the same direction and rubbing shoulders and linking arms and it works wonderfully at helping us to come up with a coherent and cohesive flow throughout the game for these various characters. We can keep going, like these two, unlikely pairing, right? This guy wants to exceed humanity by leaving it behind. This guy wants to exceed humanity 
by having it worship him as a god. So we can see how we could set that up too. We could set up those frames, and we could see how those two obsessions are both about becoming more than human, but there's a conflict there. And we can see how those two, with their distinct approaches to the same idea, would create an, an enormous amount of friction on the, on, the, on the villain's side. And the players could see, oh, this split is coming. We can see it a mile away. And then at the end, maybe they don't split, or maybe they do. Either way, we'll get to see that snap, that power behind their conflict and their, uh, you know, their conflicting views on the same subject. Now, I'm not going to say that these six characters are the best designed characters ever in the history of humanity. It's very clearly an early version of these characters. I would love to do a full redesign of them. But um, the foundation is the point here. These characters all have the same theme, and therefore they're trivially easy to combine. You can make them work together in both a shallow and a deep way, because they're built specifically to do that. They're built specifically to get along with each other. And obviously, you can spice that up in any way you want, with any kind of flavors you want. You can make them vary. You don't have to have um, four white people, one black person, and a fake digital uh, Korean lady. You can you could have something a little bit more diverse than this without any danger, without any difficulty. It would be pretty trivial. You just have to keep the same core obsession, the same theme and show different people's take on it. The more diverse these people are, the more interesting and diverse their takes, which means the more frisson there is whenever they get together. Mm. Mm. It's a great approach. It's a very powerful approach. It's a wonderful way to set up your core foundation. And you can use any theme you want. Technology is a good one, especially for this kind of game, but it could be something like power, like they, they seek uh, control over the world, you know, control as a theme, or magic as a theme. Anything you want, as long as it allows them to work together on their various projects and have overlapping lenses when it comes to what they want out of the universe. Because you want these people to shine like supernovas. Any moment where the player is not impressed by a supervillain is a moment where the supervillain is not doing their job, which is oversimplifying. Sometimes you want a supervillain to fall, but for the most part, you need your supervillains to shine. And they can. This consensus idea that the more supervillains you put into a group, the less each supervillain shines, that's comic book bullshit. Design your villains for video games if you're making a video game. That's it. Have fun.